For Pacifica Radio, November the 14th, 2024, I'm Scott Horton. This is Anti-War Radio. All right, y'all, welcome to the show. It is Anti-War Radio. I'm your host, Scott Horton. I'm editorial director of Antiwar.com, and I'm the author of the new book, which will be out real soon, Provoked, how Washington started the new Cold War with Russia and the catastrophe in Ukraine. You can find my full interview archive, more than 6,000 of them now, going back to 2003, at scotthorton.org and at youtube.com slash scotthortonshow and uh, all the other pod catchers and video sites and so forth. And, of course, I'm here every Thursday from 2.30 to 3 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., Because I'm an old radio guy. I love radio. Don't you love radio? Me too. All right. Introducing the great Connor Freeman. He is our assistant editor at the Institute and at Antiwar.com. Welcome back to the show, Connor. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, Very happy to have you here. So there's big news. President Adelson has picked her cabinet. And uh, the people are dying to hear whether... Netanyahu is going to be made prime minister of the U.S. Senate in the first hundred days or whether it's going to have to wait till summer or what's the news from the incoming Trump administration here, Connor? Well, yeah, I mean, the the first hundred days, it seems like that would be uh, the most reasonable timeline for Netanyahu to get the nomination, at least. Um, You know, we get 100 percent unanimous confirmation in the Senate to be the new prime minister. Oh, he'd sail right through. Um, Absolutely. The Democrats laying out the red carpet. Um, So, no, I mean, yeah, absolutely. This is Miriam Adelson's foreign policy cabinet. This is not an America first uh, cabinet. We have a couple of bright spots we can get to. I guess the first thing we should discuss is that Marco Rubio has been nominated to be secretary of state. Yeah, why don't you just punch me in the stomach, kid? Listen, (laughs) wait, first of all, can we just say a thing here real quick? Is America first is supposed to mean defend America first. It doesn't mean that we're all George W. Bush now and we can do whatever we want because when America first, like, right, like you're supposed to be some care and pushing to the front of the line and saying, no, me and I don't care about you. That's not what America first means. America first means defend America first. Leave the world alone. We can't afford to rule the world anyway. So we have to come home now. It means stop killing people. It doesn't mean go ahead and kill people because, oh, you're so exceptional or whatever. And by the way, you know, if you read the interventionist press over, um, which there's a lot of, but uh, Jonah Goldberg's dispatch had a piece about, oh, this is the end of American exceptionalism because Donald Trump is such an isolationist. I wish, Connor Freeman. What's really going on here? Well, uh, there was I saw earlier this week that John Podhoritz said, I wouldn't say these are the pics of my wildest dreams, but these are certainly very happy dreams. <laughs> <laughs> John Podhoritz over at Commentary Magazine is cool with it, folks. What else do you need to know? Right. We're, we're the contest. The election was between Bill Crystal's guy, Kamala Harris, and Bill Crystal's brother-in-law, Elliot Abrams guy, Donald Trump. And so, yeah, here we are. But anyway, can we let's not start with Marco Rubio, man, because I don't want the radio audience to hear me cry. What if (laughs) can we start with the person that I really do kind of like is Tulsi Gabbard, the former member of the House of Representatives and active duty major in the Hawaii National Guard who has been nominated to be the director of national intelligence. Say something nice about that, would you? Yeah, absolutely. So Tulsi is, uh, t- for me, from the foreign policy perspective, the most exciting pick thus far. Now, she's been appointed, she's been nominated to be uh, the director of national intelligence. And Tulsi, of course, made her heroic trip to Syria in 2017, where she met with President Bashar al-Assad. She was a veteran of uh, Iraq War II. She knows the shirts and skins in the Middle East. And so she called out Obama and at that time, what Trump was being, you know, inheriting the policy 
of backing al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda-affiliated forces in Syria in this dirty war against Damascus, which killed something approximate, uh, you know, uh, uh, roughly half a million people, destroyed the country of Syria, helped build the Islamist, uh, uh, the Islamic State Caliphate. And this was supported by the Israelis, the Saudis, the French, the British, Qatar, and many of our other great allies and partners supporting al-Qaeda and ISIS against people of Syria and the government of Damascus. And uh, of course, that failed and Trump called off Operation Timber Sycamore, which is what the CIA called it. Um, But he maintained his occupation in Syria, occupying roughly a third of the country in the Northeast, stealing the Syrian people's oil and And their resources. Yes. And uh, imposed the Caesar Act sanctions, which were supported by, um, it was a bipartisan project. These are this one of the most brutal sanctioned re- regimes in history, put 90% of the country below the poverty line. Everybody has limited access to water, medicine, food, uh, and, you know, cooking oil and fuel and all the other basic necessities. But Tulsi was a vehement, you know, she opposed this vehemently. Uh, in fact, she issued a censure resolution of Donald Trump in the end of 2019 during Ukraine gate, where she was actually attacking him for his hawkish Iran policy. And this was even before the assassination of General Qasem Soleimani. But she attacked him for his genocidal war in Yemen and the illegal occupation of, of Syria, among other things. Yeah. So she's she stands up for her principles. And she's also has a great record on the war in Ukraine. She said, you know, as soon as the war started, Dave DeCamp has it quoted in his article on antiwar.com about her uh, nomination. She said this war and suffering could have easily been avoided if the Biden administration and NATO had simply acknowledged Russia's legitimate security concerns regarding Ukraine becoming a member of NATO, which would mean U.S. and NATO forces right on Russia's border. And of course, this is, you know, implying that. Look, we have our Monroe Doctrine, and so if you if in and so since the 19th century, anybody that comes into the Western Hemisphere knows, with military forces, knows you are picking a fight with the United States, and if necessary, as we saw with the Cuban Missile Crisis, we will burn the entire planet down to ensure that you can't pose that kind of a threat to us, moving you know missiles, nuclear missiles into you know just on a you know a country like Cuba right off our coast, and yet we try to extend as Doug Band, I would say, our Monroe Doctrine all the way to the Taiwan Strait, to Kinmen Island even, and uh, of course Ukraine. And uh, so Tulsi's saying that no, other countries have a sphere of influence and NATO is a military alliance and uh, has, which has been mired in disastrous wars from the Balkans to North Africa to Central Asia over the last uh, you know three decades since the end of the Cold War. And poses a direct threat to Russia's security. So we just picked this fight and there was no reason to. And now, uh, you know, and she's been consistently good on this proxy war the entire time. And so that's probably the best thing about her being appointed. The thing that's, you know, troubling about Tulsi, unfortunately, is that she has a self uh, declared hawk when it comes to Dick Cheney's global war on terrorism. So often we'll hear from conservatives and libertarians, they'll say, you know, we traded. Uh, Liz Cheney for Tulsi Gabbard is the greatest deal ever. When the fact is Tulsi Gabbard's a very prominent spokeswoman for the global war on terrorism, that, but actually against the bad guys, the guys who brought the towers down, meaning Al Qaeda and now uh, the Islamic State ever since uh, George W. Bush invaded Iraq. But, you know, I mean, really, the most critical thing here is it the reason those those terrorist groups are our enemies is because of our decades of intervention in the Middle East and our support for Israel. And unfortunately, Tulsi believes that the problem is their religion. So she'll say that radical Islamism is the greatest threat to the United States. It's a global threat. These these groups want to build a global Islamic uh, caliphate and enforce us all to live under Sharia law. And the truth is the reason we were attacked by, I mean, some of them may want to do that, but the re- only reason that bin Laden was able able to recruit 19 mostly Saudis and Egyptians to go on this kamikaze mission on September 11, 2001, was because of U.S. support for Israel's brutal, illegal military occupation, foreign military occupations of the Palestinians and of the Lebanese uh, for decades, and also U.S. sanctions on Iraq, which killed hundreds of thousands of children and other civilians, not to mention the fact that Bill Clinton was bombing Iraq three to four times a week. 
and our military bases peppered throughout uh, the Middle East, particularly on the Arabian Peninsula as a part of the Car- Jimmy Carter doctrine. And there were other grievances as well. But this is what motivated uh, the 9-11 attacks. And I would argue that it was mostly is when you're talking about the lead hijackers anyway, it was U.S. support for Israel's invasion and occupation of southern Lebanon and their brutality unleashed against the Palestinian Muslims and Christians yeah. of Gaza and the West Bank. And, you know, and a so, huge part of that story, too, Connor, of course, and everybody knows this and it sometimes goes with saying and sometimes without was that Ronald Reagan backed these guys in Afghanistan in the 80s and almost always left unsaid is that Bill Clinton backed them in Bosnia, Kosovo, and Chechnya in the 90s and that they wouldn't have been able to do what they did if they hadn't have been groomed by Western intelligence agencies, mostly America, Britain, and then our uh, clients, the Saudis, uh, that whole time in the lead-up to the thing, which is not to say they control them in the inside job theory because I don't think that's what happened there, I think. They did create a Frankenstein monster and then they provoked them and we got some blowback and that's how things go. Exactly as you say, because exactly as they said, is there were specific reasons that they were doing this and with their motive and strategy very clear. But I think the most important point about Gabbard is that, as you said, she's an Iraq War II vet and knows the shirts from the skins. So when Obama says, come on, everybody, it's time to switch sides. Now we're backing the Iraqi Sunni insurgency in Syria. She said, what? No, they killed my friend Jimmy. Like, what are you talking about? That's the same guys who were the bad guys six weeks ago, which is accurate. And every other idiot in Washington was going along with this because they hate the Shiites more because that's what Israel wants. And she may be as Zionist as Netanyahu, but she ain't that Zionist that she's willing to back a bunch of Bin Ladenite suicide bomber head choppers in Syria. And so she put her foot down. And as you say, it's a matter of principle, but it's also a matter of intellect and knowledge and You know, you look at that redirection article by Seymour Hirsch from 07 and Condoleezza Rice is going, you know, the thing is, it's not so much about Sunnis and Shiites. It's all about who's an extremist and who's a moderate. And it's like, no, that's because you're trying to change the subject from the Sunnis to the Shiites. Liar. Right. And so what we're just not going to see, I mean, I don't know. She is very Zionist, but but we're certainly not going to see her lying and saying that, you know, Al Qaeda is in bed with Hezbollah and that's why we got to attack him. And we're certainly not going to see her taking Al Qaeda's side, even if she bombs Hezbollah, helps Trump bomb Hezbollah. She ain't going to do it in support of Mujahideen forces on the ground, which is what the Democrats would do. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, what can I say? Um she is much less worse than most of them. And as you say, even where she was really bad on Iran there for a while, she also attacked Trump when he was being too harsh on Iran, which goes to show, I think, that she was wising up a little bit that like, wait a minute, we don't need to fight Iran. We don't need to fight Russia and China. We do need to kill bin Ladenites. And like, honestly, I'm an anti-war guy. And I think, you know, as you said, that's Dick Cheney's excuse for doing whatever he wants from, you know, Nigeria to the Philippines. And so... That can't be the writ, just find bin Ladenites with rifles and kill them because there's just too many and it's a self-perpetuating thing. But at least she's got her eye on the target of people who slaughtered American civilians rather than supporting them against their enemies, which is, you know, the typical thing from the Carter years all the way through today. It's only the immediate aftermath of September 11th when America switched sides against al-Qaeda before switching back again in the Bush and Obama years. So anyway... And she's going to be the director of national intelligence, which means I don't know exactly what kind of authority she'll have over covert ops that may be between Trump and his CIA director, Ratcliffe, who had been the DNI before. But at least we know she's not going to lie to him on behalf of the machine the way that Gina Haspel did. Oh, look, Donald Trump, here's pictures of some sick ducks from the Russian poison. And and yeah, no, that is, you know, so at least he's going to get the truth. And and then the rest of him and his absolutely horrifically horrible cabinet can decide what to do based on that. Hey, guys, I've had a lot of great webmasters over the years, but the team at ExpandDesigns.com have by far been the most competent and reliable. Harley Abbott and his team have made great sites for the show and the Institute, and they keep them running well, suggesting and making improvements all along. Make a deal with ExpandDesigns.com for your new business or news site. They will take care of you. Use the promo code SCOTT 
and save $500. That's expanddesigns.com. Man, I wish I was in school so I could drop out and sign up for Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom instead. Tom has done such a great job on putting together a classical curriculum for everyone from junior high schoolers on up through the postgraduate level. And it's all very reasonably priced. Just make sure you click through from the link in the right margin at scotthorton.org. Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. Real history. Real economics. Real education. Well, I guess it was just a matter of time. I drank so much coffee I turned into some. Hey guys, check out the Scott Horton Show special blend at MundosArtisanCoffee.com. It's a blend of organically grown Ethiopian and Sumatran coffee beans. Two very different coffees combined to create a unique blend. Ethiopia is smooth and medium-bodied. Sumatra, a rich, heavy-bodied coffee. And it's got caffeine. Lots of it. Which is good for if you have to drive drunk or get up in the morning. Click through from the link in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org to save 10% on your order. It's the Scott Horton Show blend from Mundo's Artisan Coffee. So now go ahead and tell us about Marco Rubio. I just can't believe this. Marco Rubio sitting in Thomas Jefferson's chair, dude? Really? Marco yeah. Rubio? Well, yeah. I mean, so, you know, the most distressing thing about this is, um, you know, after Trump won the election... Dave Smith had launched the Never Pompeo campaign, which t- we gathered tremendous steam on Twitter. You know, uh, I know, Scott, you've been writing the book and you're, you've been off Twitter for so long, but this was actually the number one trend, uh, not just in politics. I mean, on the entire Twitter platform, it was the number one trend. So Pompeo, it was announced that Pompeo and Nikki Haley will not be in the administration. Donald Trump said that on True Social. We all celebrated And then shortly after, it turns out that he's actually appointing his duplicate in the form of Marco Rubio to be secretary of state. Um, The secretary of defense pick we can get into this guy. I'm pretty concerned about Pete Hegseth from Fox News. Wait, well, stick to Rubio for a minute there. For for people who are not familiar, you know, this show airs on the FM radio out on the West Coast. Maybe they don't know who's this Florida kook in the U.S. Senate. Fill us in here. So Rubio is a neoconservative spokesman. He's been in the Senate since 2011. He supported every military intervention, regardless of who was holding the executive branch. He backed the war in Libya. He he opposed any troop withdrawals from Afghanistan following Obama's surge, which accomplished nothing except making the Taliban stronger and getting more American soldiers killed and killing more innocent Afghans. He supported a no-fly zone over Syria, just like Hillary Clinton when he was running for president in 2016, which would have been World War III. I mean, this is one of the things that tipped the scales and actually won the election for Donald Trump against Hillary Clinton because everybody knew, even if they weren't paying attention too much to what was going on in Syria, they knew that shooting down Russian planes over Syria surely meant World War III, but that's what Marco Rubio was running on. And Rubio also is a huge Latin American hawk. Uh, He helped support all of Donald Trump's policies against Venezuela, including the sanctions which killed tens of thousands of people by depriving them of critical medicines. And also this included the attempted coups. He actually tweeted out a picture of Muammar Gaddafi while he was alive and then after he had been sodomized with a sword and murdered in the streets of Libya as a threat to President Nicolas Maduro of Venezuela. He takes uh, ownership over the sanctions regime imposed on Cuba during the Donald Trump years. He's a massive supporter of Israel's genocidal This war is in just Gaza. one kook that he's describing here, folks. This is the new secretary of state. You might have thought he was describing George Bush's entire war cabinet, <laughs> the, the entire staff of the vice president's office. No, this is all just Marco Rubio's biography still. Please go ahead. He also introduced a bill into Congress, which was signed by Joe Biden that ties the president's hands and prevents him from ever leaving NATO unless it's approved by the Senate or an act of Congress. So that's sort of Trump proofing the policy in Ukraine. Uh, Also, he's a huge China hawk. He even has sanctions imposed on him by Beijing, which may make it difficult for him to travel to the country to actually do his job as being the top diplomat if he has any interest in it whatsoever. He has called for Israel to attack Iran disproportionately in a direct call to violate international law and 
cause a a war that could drag the United States into it. But he says United States will continue to stand with Israel. So and he's also one of these guys who, you know, he he yells at the code pink ladies whenever they ask him if he'll support a ceasefire. And he says that every woman, child and innocent man that dies in Gaza is uh, Hamas is to blame. And Israel needs to kill everybody they can get their hands on. Uh, he, But, you know, they're all Hamas is the way he sort of frames it. So this is this is the the same. We may as well have Mike Pompeo running the State Department again. This is a ultra hawk on China, Russia, Iran. He'll he be should have made Kamala Anthony Harris Blinken. the secretary of state. Right. He'll be inheriting Antony Blinken's catastrophe in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, and he'll only be worse based on his every part of his record. Well, and, and he's such an concerning. idiot. Like, I'm sorry, I'm not trying yeah. to be insulting on a like ad hominem basis, but I'm just saying Marco Rubio is unintelligent. And as you have explained, has no wisdom whatsoever about what is right and what is wrong. And the idea of him being a diplomat at all. I mean, Anthony Blinken, I can at least see him doing the job of State Department weenie. You know what I mean? Like he fits. But Marco Rubio, he's just so clumsy. I just don't know how this is going to work at all. He's just terrible. But it, you know what? Before we talk about uh, Hexbeth, which we need to do, the, def- the uh, Secretary of Defense nominee here, we do have to talk about Miriam Adelson. I started the show joking that President Adelson has picked her war cabinet, but that really is true. She wrote a check for $100 million. This is Sheldon Adelson's widow. The Republican Party is dictated to by the widow of a guy who ran a casino in communist China. (laughs) That's who conservative American Republicans take their marching orders from. And she's an Israeli. She got American citizenship, you know, as a ceremonial thing to make it less illegal for her to control the U.S. government with cash. And Donald Trump is just a transactional enough guy that, yeah, she wrote him a check for $100 million, and then now she gets to vet his entire cabinet, clearly, and then next will be the full annexation of the West Bank. What am I missing? Yeah, well, as Charlie Kirk would say, do you have a problem with American citizens lobbying their own government? Yeah. If they want us to invade Uzbekistan for Kazakhstan, then yeah, they should register as a foreign agent and they should not be able to donate to American candidates. Yeah, well, exactly. And so to apropos of this, we have Mike Huckabee being appointed the ambassador to Israel. And this is being celebrated by the Israelis, by David Friedman, the former ambassador. Well, now this is important, Connor, because You know, I know a lot of sophisticated liberal city dwellers might think, well, that guy has such a goofy name and he's just some goofy southerner. But it's really important about him of exactly which Protestant Christian sect he belongs to. And I don't know the name of it, but I do hear him talk about what he thinks about the Middle East. And it's not based on living in this world in our era. It's based on his memories of Sunday school as a child. It sounds like Hegseth is the same way, but Huckabee has, uh, you know, Haaretz has uh, reports on his ties with settler organizations. In 2017, he visited a settlement in the West Bank and declared, I think Israel has title deed to Judea and Sumeria. This was on CNN. There are certain words I refuse to use. There is no such thing as the as a West Bank. It's Judea and Sumeria. There's no such thing as a settlement. There are communities, their neighborhoods, their cities. There's no such thing as an occupation, and there's really no such thing as a Palestinian. So as you can imagine, Itamar Ben-Gavir, the radical Kahanist national security minister of Israel, has tweeted out Huckabee, uh, you know, his name with a heart emoji, an American flag and an Israeli flag. And I should say that the, you know, Bezalel, Smotrich, all the worst hardliners in Netanyahu's government are celebrating not only Donald Trump's victory, but these cabinet picks. Uh, In fact, you know what? There was this uh, conjecture about after the report surfaced a couple of days before it was officially announced that Rubio was going to be the secretary of state nominee. And there were a lot of Trump surrogates saying, oh, no, listen, Donald Trump hasn't confirmed it personally until you see it on true social. It's not true. So I was talking with one of our friends from defend the guard on Twitter 
and he goes, well, hopefully this isn't true. And I, I found that Danny Danon was the uh, ambassador, the permanent representative, the Israeli permanent representative of the UN, who's a Likudnik, was already saying, congratulations, Marco Rubio, on your appointment. Oh, and I go, well, listen, Likud's already calling it. And that was like two days ago. That was like two nights before it was officially announced. By the way, I want to mention, and I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but I did see Glenn Greenwald's interview of the producer of it. And it's a brand new documentary on Al Jazeera, guys. It's on YouTube. It's called Investigating War Crimes in Gaza. It's all based on footage that the Israelis took of themselves, killing Palestinians and destroying their property. It's all selfies. It's all them filming each other committing war crimes against the people of Palestine. So you can't really do too much about spinning that. Yeah, and this is the live stream genocide. We see it from the victim's perspective and we see it from the perpetrator's perspective. Yeah. I mean, this is the ugliest thing going on in the world, you guys. And yes, it's about to get much worse. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm predicting um, full annexation and then the cleansing of the West Bank because why not? And I'm not trying to normalize that idea that like, oh, yeah, this be the absolute worst outrage. But who's going to stop them now? Well, Bezalel, Smotrich, and Huckabee are saying, well, Smotrich seems more confident that it's going to get done. But they're both saying that 2025, or at least the Trump, this Trump term, provides the opportunity for Israel to extend its sovereignty finally over what they call Judea and Samaria, the occupied West Bank. And I don't know what that means, that they're going to take just Area C first and see what happens. I'll tell you what it means. It means that Tulsi Gabbard is going to have her hands full keeping al-Qaeda terrorists from slaughtering Americans as long yep. as the rest of the government is over here motivating it all. Yeah, and the most important factor there that, that you know, I hope Tulsi understands is that we run into a fundamental problem here because Israel's enemies are our enemies. Uh, are not our enemies. Actually, they're Al Qaeda's enemies. So when we fight these, whatever the Israelis call it, the seven front war, if we're going to be bombing Hezbollah and bombing the Houthis and bombing Syria and bombing the popular mobilization forces in Iraq and the Shiite militias in Syria and, and bombing Iran even, we are attacking and attempting to help Israel obliterate the fiercest regional enemies of Al Qaeda and the Islamic State. So it seems like a perfect opportunity to pursue a non interventionist policy and cease our backing of Israel or any of these other groups in the region, any of our Gulf dictatorship satellites who she's fingered for genocide, yeah. uh, namely Saudi Arabia and the United Arab right. Emirates. And, and I'm sorry, we're out of time, Connor, but just tell us real quick about this guy, Hexbeth. I know you've got the short brief on what a real kooky seems to be, huh? Heg Seth is a, uh, I don't know, again, what kind of uh, Christian sect he's from, but he's, he seems like a real fundamentalist. He uh, says that we need, to, you know, Israel needs to knock down the Al-Aqsa Mosque and rebuild the Third Temple. After uh, Trump uh, assassinated Qasem Soleimani, he was on Fox News saying, right now is the time we need to go into Iran and bomb their nuclear facilities. We need to bomb their oil facilities. We need to bomb, if they've got weapons uh, in, in hospitals, mosques, uh, and schools, then that's what, you, that's what Islamists do. They they use human shields. You got to you got to rewrite the rules of war because right now the ones that we wrote after World War Two are working against mm. us. and We need to bomb Man, the civilian sites. I saw and a clip. I saw a clip of him being interviewed explaining his idea of what's going on in Ukraine. And he's like, Putin just wants to take back what's his. The he, Soviet he, Union. Yeah. Yeah. And just. Man, he, like he doesn't know anything about it at all. This is going to be the secretary of defense. And he doesn't know nothing. Yeah. And then last thing, Scott, we have Mike Waltz, who's a very dangerous. This guy was, has been groomed at the America First Policy Institute, which is run by uh, Vice Chairman Fred Flights, who's John Bolton's longtime right hand man. This uh -huh. guy was calling to send American military advisors to Ukraine as early as 2022. <laughs> America huge... First run by John Bolton. Yeah. For those of you who can't tell the difference between sects of Republicans, <laughs> you know. Anyway. Scott, you'll love this. To, to bring Putin to the table, what we need to do is authorize long-range strikes with American-provided missiles in the Russian mainland and ramp up sanctions on Russia. Oh, man. Yep. We're in real trouble. That's the advisor of the president for national security affairs. That's who's running the National Security Council. A whole lot of deranged talks with Tulsi Gabbard, who's great on a lot of things and has her flaws, but will not be able to rein them all in anyway. I don't know. I don't think that would be her job anyway.
So we'll see. But, yeah, it's bad news. And the poor Gazans, man. And, you know, this is the least we paid attention to what's actually happening in Gaza on this show in a year just because it's more about what's about to happen to them. Um, and not that the Democrats were going to protect the poor Palestinians. They've been the ones killing them by the high tens of thousands for the last year straight. It's, you know, Biden and Harris and Netanyahu's war as much as it's Netanyahu and Ben Gavir's war over there and Smotrich. So um, Trump's so National Security Advisor nominee says that we're going to we need to finish the job in Gaza, like Donald Trump says, get it over with fast. Let Israel do whatever they need to do. And then we'll put a credible military threat on the table to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons, which is a these, lie. And he says arm Taiwan to the teeth. <laughs> These are the people in charge. This is a national security advisor, the secretary of defense, and they don't know their ass from their elbow. They actually don't know anything except right wing talking point crap. Right. They and they and they're not lying. They're really stupid. They really don't know what they're talking about. So yep. that's very reassuring. Oh, yeah. I'm really confident. I think it's yep. going to be great. Well, well they're going to force first. Jesus to come back and it's going to we're all going to get raptured up to heaven in our bodies. So. Good luck with that, everyone. Um, all right. Thank you very much. Connor Freeman, everybody, from Antiwar.com. Appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. All right, you guys, and that's it for Antiwar Radio. <laughs> good afternoon and good luck. I'm here uh, every Thursday from 2.30 to 3 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. See you next week.